recorded. Uh, so, uh, Isa, for your information also, after your session, um, this student should have to do a reflection uh, piece, um, telling me exactly what do they learn and how can they implement what they learn after this. So, Isa, uh, once again, thank you so much for coming to uh, the class uh, and uh, I'm passing the floor to you. Thank you, Dr. Doria. So, actually, I do not expect that Dr. Doria approached me just to share my experience before I come to ETM. So, basically, I want to share a little bit. I didn't, uh, at first, I didn't really expect to work at this uh, this environment as an early childhood educator. It's not easy because you need to manage uh, the little kids, you need to teach them at the same time. It's not for like educational way, but also a long life learning. So today I'll be sharing to you about uh, an early childhood education. So I try to keep it as simple as possible so you can like understand more about it. So we'll get through four topics today. So the first one, of course, get to know me, who am I? and how long I've been working for. And then the next topic will be my experience working as an early childhood educator. And the third topic is their cognitive development throughout uh, the session. And then the fourth topic will be the Q&A session. Uh, next, okay, get to know me. So my name is Izan Bittisharo, the full name. Uh, I'm 22 years old. Uh, and I have experience working eight months in the kindergarten. It's actually quite long for me since uh, I've taken, I took diploma before. So after my diploma, I have like a lot of free time before I, I wait for the degree. So that's why I try to uh, experience uh, some working. So I try, I go to uh, early childhood education uh, field. So, yeah, so now I'm taking bachelor degree in education uh, of TASEL. So, I also teach two and three years old and also six years old at the kindergarten. So, next is the experience working as an early childhood educator. So, uh, before we get into the topics that we will learn. So we will learn first about the, uh, the kindergarten background itself. So the kindergarten name is the Garden Johor Jaya. So the operation hours will be 8 a.m. until 6.30 p.m. Uh, it includes the edu care time. And of course, you can Facebook it, uh, uh, the Garden Edu Care Johor Jaya. You can search it on Facebook. There's a lot of the activities and it's, uh, it's fun thing to just search it. Uh, okay, so the kindergarten normally is called two years old. It depends. So two years old, it depends when the kids uh, can walk, they can. It's okay if they are not free diapers. It's okay. So just we just take it. But as long as they can walk until six years old. And then the school time is 8 a.m. until 12.30 p.m. So next, let's see for their timetable for two and three years old. So for two and three years old, as you can see here, there's a messy play, practical life, uh, gross motor skills, sensory, character building. This is the subjects that I would like to focus on because uh, just like Dr. Doria said, not, uh, I think the early childhood education has not been exposed to all the parents. Actually, early childhood education is very important for the kids to develop their skills at the early ages. So when I work there, I can see that there's a lot of skills that we actually don't know that is important to the kids, that is actually important for them. To them develop their, even how to hold a pencil also, that's a skill they need to master before they can hold a pencil and they can write it uh, nicely. So we will look at one by one. So the first uh, subject that I would like to focus on is uh, messy play. So actually, what is messy play? Messy play is allowing the children 
to make a mess so they can use their senses in a logical and educational way. So since the kids, uh, they are naturally curious and messy play can engage with their senses at the development level that is appropriate for them. So they learn foundational cognitive principle as they exercise motor skills, language skills and social skills. So uh, there's a few examples for the messy play, such as uh, jelly smashing, uh, eyes, uh, flower and scent. So, okay, I'll show you the picture. So this is the few pictures. So the first picture, uh, the boy is playing with the sand. Uh, it is good actually for them because some kids actually, they are quite disgusted with sands and um. Even the plants, they feel like it's quite disgusting. Even to uh, even to like touch it, even to see it, they feel like maybe it's quite disgusting. And actually, this messy play, it's good for them, for they for they to experience the messy itself, and they can experience the how how to say it's to feel the sand itself. So they will not feel disgust when they play, uh, when the when they play when they playing. So next is the uh, jelly smashing. Jelly smashing, uh, they can like uh, smash the jelly so they can learn their social skills as well. So normally when they are playing the messy play, they will talk to their friends. Oh, this is how the jelly feels like. Oh, this is, oh, it's so nice. There's a lot of colors of the jelly. So normally we put, uh, we mold the jelly and we put the toys inside it. So they can like smash it and then they can take out the, take out the toys and it's quite fun for them. So they can improve their social skills. They can improve their cognitive uh, level skills to learn more. Uh, instead of focusing on the uh, normal educational way, we try to make it a uh, fun way to learn. So the next is like the normal messy play, which is the hand painting. So they can like, uh, we give them a paper, they can paste uh, their hands so they can see like a lot of colors. They can add the colors as well. They can see their shape of hands. So it's quite good for them actually. A messy play is quite important. So next is practical life. Practical life is an activities of everyday life that they involve in, uh, in their daily life. And the child observes these activities in the environment and gains knowledge through the real experience on how to accomplish life skills in purposeful way. Uh, practical, th practical life activities also help to give the child a sense of being and belonging established through participation in daily life with us. So for example, for practical life, uh, as cooking, washing dishes, hang the clothes, and tie shoes. Maybe for adults like us, we feel like, oh, it's such like, um, it's an easy skills to accomplish. But for for the little kids, for two and three years old, uh, it's actually important to them. We teach them how to help uh, in their daily life purpose. Maybe like stacking the chair, uh, cooking, maybe like cooking a simple, simple dishes. They can wash their Tupperware after they eat. They can hang the clothes. They can tie the shoes. They can keep their shoes at the right place. It's actually important for a lifelong, lifelong learning. So this is the activities that we've done. So the first one is stacking chairs. So for practical life, normally for two and three years old, we can see that, uh, that they are quite unstable when they're carrying something heavy. So uh, in practical life, we also uh, ask them to uh, carry a chair without falling down. So we teach them how to be careful with their friends, how to carry the chair in a safe way, how to stack it. So normally after the class session, uh, I will ask them to stack their chairs behind so they can learn. Okay, after class, they need to stack their chairs properly. Uh, so it's a good for them. Uh, even at home also, they can 
uh, apply it at home. They can like, okay, after you do this, you need to uh, do this. Okay, like that. Okay, next one is the washing dishes. It's actually also quite good for them. At least um, they can learn. When they are washing dishes, they shouldn't uh, open the water too, too fast. Okay, try to open like water slowly and then try to watch. It's also good for them to remember, okay, if there's a still, there's a still, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, there's a food still, there's still food inside the Tupperware. They need to like, uh, wash it down, uh, and then close it in a, in a good way. Sorry. Okay, next one is the gross motor skills. So the gross motor skills uh, meaning is the movement that involves in the coordination of the arms, legs, and other large body parts and movement. And it is important for young children to practice as they develop because it helps the children learn how to coordinate, coordinate and control their body movement. So example, running, crawling, swimming, and hopping uh it's actually an experience i i feel that actually jumping is a uh, something that the children know how to do it but when i worked there i found that there's the one or two kids that actually cannot jump from one place to one place by not falling down actually jumping is also and important skills for them. So I found that the there are a few kids that I cannot that I cannot jump properly. So is uh, the gross motor skills is actually good for them since we ask them to hop from the one hula hoop to one hula hoop without falling down, and then we ask them uh, to walk in a straight line because uh, I know it sounds quite funny, but there's actually a kids who cannot walk in a street line believe or not it's like there's actually a kids who cannot walk in a street line so we as a yeah we as a teachers uh, we need to guide them how to walk in a street line how to run and then stop suddenly stop we need to teach them how to hop from one place to one place without falling down. This is what we want from the kids without having themselves uh, bleeding or something like that. So we as a teacher, we need to like guide them one by one. Maybe for the like first few months, they cannot accomplish that. But in the end, you can see that they are improving uh, little by little. So it's actually good for them. Even walk on the bench also, there's some kids actually almost fall, but we actually, we managed to catch, catch the kids. But yeah, it's quite funny actually to see them like walking, something like that. Okay, next is uh, sensory play. So sensory play, uh, okay, sensory play, the meaning is developing fine motor skills through tactical play. And it's supporting brain development, enhancing memory, complex tasks and problem solving. So the example is holding pencils, playing with Lego and flowers. So sensory, we normally uh, include the play with five senses. You can touch, you can see, you can, uh, you can smell and all of it. Again, one, one of the play that are very interesting is marshmallow and some and actually, some of the kids don't even know what is marshmallow. So we give them the marshmallow. The marshmallow feel like very squishy, right? Squishy and very soft. And it smell nice. So some of the kids like, like to play like squish, squish the marshmallow. So it's good for their brain development. So they, they can hold the marshmallow. They say, oh, this is what marshmallow feels like. It's so soft. It's so squishy. And it smells so nice. So it's a good for their brain development. They can distinguish, uh, distinguish their senses one by one. So next is, this is the fun, uh, the the best play which is imaginative play so since the kids they have a lot of imaginative uh 
imaginative. Uh, they they are very they like to think what if I become this? What if I become that? So imaginative play can help them to make to make believe at as it sometimes referred to occurs and a child role play experience of interest. So such as playing schools with their toys and it's actually good for their social skills and language skills. I'm sorry, that's a uh, typo there. I'm sorry. <laughs> so one of the example is role play as a chef. So we actually did that. See? They role play as a carpenter, they role play as an animal, they also role play as a doctor. It's actually good for their social skills because they will play, okay, uh, normally I will say, okay, what is the sound of cow? Okay, try to act like a cow, how the cow looks like. So we will play like some of the videos first to see, to let them see what the animals look like in a real life. And then for the, uh, and then the kids were like, oh, that's how the cow will walk. And then they will walk like a cow and then sound like a cow. So it's quite cute and very nice to have them play like that. Okay. And then like for the doctor, one will act as a patient and one will act, act like a doctor. And then the doctor will say, oh, uh, uh, where are you? Where, where? Where did you get the sick? Okay, I want to check you. Uh, how do you feel today? So, oh, this is the one thing that I almost forgot to say. Actually, this kindergarten is an international kindergarten. So, there's a lot of, uh, so the majority of the students is actually uh, Chinese. Uh, there's also Japanese. There's also um, from Korea. So, uh, to be honest, I'm the only one Malay who's in the kindergarten. I'm the only one Malay teacher there. And there's no Malay students in the kindergarten. So <laughs> it's quite challenging for me because uh, normally the kids, they're still learning a new language, which is English. So I I try to learn a little bit Chinese. Uh, that's why I require... Maybe from 1 until 10, I can speak like around 4 to 5 Chinese, something like that. Um, so, it's actually quite important where you can use uh, two languages when you are teaching them. The first one, normally I will talk to them in English. Uh, after that, I will translate. Uh, if they don't really understand, I will try to talk with them in uh, Chinese. So normally, all the kids here can uh, can understand and can try to speak back in English very well. Even though they are only two and three years old, they can understand it really, really well. It's actually a good, uh, good practice also for them to their to develop their new languages instead of mother tongue. So next is the character building. Character building is also important to help the kids to become responsible, courageous, honest, and kind human being. Because we want the kids to have a good character in their life and to build the good habits. Uh, maybe the habits uh, take time to form it, but we try to, okay, for the first month, we will learn how to say thank you. The second month, we will learn how to say sorry. So this is the, even though this thing is, uh, maybe it, look, it looks like uh, easy for us, but actually it's really good for them to develop the good character. So at least, at least when they are outside or when they are with their parents, they know how to say thank you to strangers, to other people. They know how to say sorry when they, are, they make mistakes. It's actually good for them to even develop their social skills and they can also improve their, their communication skills. So next is uh, the normal subject, which is, which is, uh, which are English, maths, and Mandarin. So instead of we use the old method, which is paper and pencil, uh, so this kindergarten really want us, uh, as a teacher, they really want us to 
develop uh, a fun activity for them instead of just sit down and then just write just like um the old method they want a new method 21st century learning so the example is we go we go outdoor to find okay um for example we okay for this week we will learn the letter uh l maybe uh and then we go outside uh the outdoor what are the things that is that is start with l so such as leaves so they try so they collect the leaves so it is good actually for them so they are not like feel sleepy and they will not bored with the class okay we try also tracing using beans and flower so this is the few uh, activities so they will trace the word the letter d on the flower so it's fun for them it's also actually a sensory skills where they also can feel the flower itself so next is hair so uh i try to find uh something that is very fun so do that and then uh pasting the beans on the h letter so we can see how they uh improving one by one it's very fun actually to teach them so next is uh for six years old uh so for six years old uh, uh because they almost uh go to the primary school we actually focus more on their uh educational things instead of like playing but we still let them play but not like as much as two and three years old so this is the timetable for six years old so yeah uh for monday until thursday we will make uh we will uh put the educational thing on monday and thursday and for friday we actually didn't let them uh, we let them to be free on that day instead of teach we let uh, we will do like arts we will dancing moving around instead of like sitting so next is for uh six years old they have language skills so language skills it supports the ability of your children to communicate and express and understand the feelings and it also support your child's thinking ability and helps them to develop and maintain relationship with their friends or even with their parents so this is the video Okay, for language skills, we normally ask them to speak in front of their friends because six years old, we also need to develop their skills to speak in front of your friends to help them uh, to help them to make them what is it called? <laughs> okay it's okay i forgot okay uh it's also can yeah confident thank you doctor <laughs> to help them being confident with themselves to and then uh to remove their stage fright even okay until now even uh we are we are already old some of the like adults also still have the stage fright so we actually ask them to practice more on their confidence talk in front of their friends and then they will uh, draw they will speak they will explain to them it's also good for communication skills and also their social skills <clears throat> oh. okay next is uh the difference between two and three years old we have the signs so signs from the this kindergarten is quite different so instead of learning from the book we make uh experiment uh experiment for them to make their interest in science increase so this is the experiment experiment that we have done for them
Is it a video? Is that? Is yeah. it a video? Is it a video just now? Yeah, yeah, it's a video. Oh, is it lagging? Oh, it's lag. Yeah, so uh, what is the video about? Okay, the video is about an experiment, a magic milk experiment, where the, there's a milk and we put a food coloring on the milk and the students must put the soap uh, on the food coloring and the food coloring will spread throughout the milk. So it's actually a good experiment. They can like observe it on how the color will spread on the milk. So it's kind of developed their curiosity during the experiment itself. Uh, it's actually good. I really like when the kindergarten itself asks us to like do experiment instead of do instead of like write on the book and then learn like something you cannot see or you cannot do the experiment. So yeah, uh, and then all the subjects for six years old is the same as the two and three years old, such as imaginative play, practical life, and uh, so on. So I will not like uh, repeat the same uh, the same things over and over again. So yeah, let's move to topic three, which is the cognitive development for two, three, and six years old. So as you know, so what is cognitive development? So cognitive development in early childhood education refers to the intellectual growth and acquisition of knowledge and skills during the early years of a child, child's life, typically from birth to around eight years old. So it involves the development of cognitive process such as attention, memory, problem solving, language, and logical thinking. So during these periods, which means uh, during the kindergarten period, children experience a rapid brain development and are highly receptive to learning. So in early child education programs and activities play a crucial role in supporting and promoting their cognitive development. So uh, it is important for the parents to send their kids, their children, to a correct uh, kindergarten who teach them their, their all the skills that they need to learn, uh, such as the uh, practical life skills, uh, imaginative uh, learning skills. So it's important for them to develop their cognitive process. Uh, next, uh, this, this, uh, these are the few key aspects of cognitive development in early child education that I've found during the, the day I teach before. So the first one is a uh, sensory motor stage, which is in the first two years, uh, ch children primarily learn through their senses and motor activities, uh, such as sensory and gross motor skills. So that is why the sensory skills and the gross motor skills is very important to them, for them to develop in the sensory motor stage. So next is pre-operational stage. Uh, so at this stage, uh, during age two and the seven, the child needs to concrete physical situation, which means objects are classified in simple ways based on their important features. Uh, as the child is not able to conceptualize abstractly. <clears throat> and then next is a benefit of cognitive development that are found uh, during, uh, as an early child educator during at that time. So the benefits, the first one is it's promote life term learning. So as I mentioned before, uh, such as a practical life uh, practical life play. So it promotes a long-term learning, uh, how to tie shoes, how to hang your clothes. So learning, uh, so as we all know, is actually learning is a lifelong uh, process. So cognitive learning encourages students to take a hands-on approach to learning, which will help them make improvement decision later in life by studying all the pros and cons. So they will know uh, what is good for them, what is bad for them. So that's why we also have the 
uh, language skills, something like that. So next one is improve their confidence. So with deeper comprehension skills and more knowledge, children can approach life with greater enthusiasm and confidence, helping them to be success successful in all their endeavors. So uh, I'll take one example, such as uh, language skills. So it improved their confidence with deeper comprehension skills and also can improve their communication skills with their friends, with their parents. They can use uh, other language instead of their mother tongue language. So it can help them to be successful in the future. So next is, uh, it improves a memory. So a deeper understanding of the subjects make the student retain the knowledge gained for a longer time thus improving their memory. So for example, instead of uh, the old method that we always use, we ask them to go outside, to go uh, play at outside. So instead of like sitting down in a trapped classroom, sometimes it makes the children itself feel pressure uh, when you sit in the classroom in a long time because kids, two and six years old, they always have this one, one attitude where they don't like to sit in the classroom. They don't like to sit down for a long time. They don't like to see the book for a long time. So we as an early child educator must uh, put an effort to make them go outside to experience a learning where they can improve their memory. So instead of like sitting down like uh, learning, okay, at the whiteboard, like, okay, A, B, C, and then how to spell it, how to spell that. Okay, we go outside, we go see the outside world, jumping, go play at the playground. It is actually good for them. And next is it can improve, uh, I think, Yep, it's the same one. I think that's a typo there. I'm really sorry. Okay, uh, that's all for me. Uh, thank you for hearing my session. I, I know it's quite short because I only have like eight months of uh, teaching before. So that's all for me. Thank you. So is there any question that you want to ask? Uh, as the instructor for this class, let me start the, the ball rolling. <laughs> Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Ida. Uh, even though you mentioned it's only eight months, uh, your presentation is very clear. Uh, this is something that I need to acknowledge you. Lah. Uh, and if uh, guys, if you notice, uh, Isa actually uh, split the presentation to very clear segments. So I think you can think about questions uh, from, from those components. Um, my question, uh, there are three, essentially. Uh, number one, um, what is the uh, size like for your uh, kindy? Is it, uh, uh, and what is the ratio of teacher to student? So one student, one teacher, uh, that would be a very expensive kindergarten to go. Um, uh, so that's question number one. Question number two, uh it's your um is the curriculum so who designed uh the the thinking behind the curriculum because uh just now you presented uh two components two to three years old one uh component and then uh six years old uh one component uh but you uh so who who are the brains behind designing this how do they design it uh, so that's uh, curriculum design. Uh, the third question is um, on the experiments itself. Uh, I am interested to, to, to hear that you teach experiments to the children rather than explaining science uh, through books. So um, in the whole process, uh, which one is more important for you and your teachers? Uh, getting them to describe uh, what they see or getting them to understand the concept because at six years old for uh, to be honest they they might not understand a lot but then uh, if they observe if they are able to tell you what's happening I think it's a very good progress so uh, the third question is on the experiment 
Thank you. Okay, for the first question, it's about the ratio between student and teacher. We actually did, okay, for two and three years old, since they still little, so ratio for them is one teacher, two kids for the two and three years old, since they need a lot of attention instead of the six years old. So for six years old, the ratio is actually one teacher, one class, and one class consists of 20 students. So uh, for 20 students in kindergarten is actually not quite a lot since uh, they're already six years old. So we need to teach them how to be independent. So, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so for the two and three years old, also for my answer is two and three years old, the ratio between the teacher and the students is one to two or one to three. And the for six years old is for one, one teacher to 20 students. And the second question is about curriculum design. It's actually our boss itself who wants, uh, who designed it. So we only need to make, uh, activity throughout the learning session. So our boss itself, uh, he, he want to have a fun learning way kindergarten. So we need to meet the requirement as a teacher. So we teacher itself need to be very, very creative with our activity. Instead of like, um, like I said before, instead of like sitting down, the boss itself want us to like go Mm, go outside, touch the grass, something like that. So, so yeah, actually the brain is our boss itself. And us as a teacher, we need to be creative on how to teach them, how to make them uh, remember everything when they learn. Uh, the next one is about science experiment. Uh, how to say we actually don't really want them to understand the concept behind it because if they learn the concept, it will be like, oh, too much for them. So we actually want them to observe it. Uh, what happened? Okay, if uh, we actually want them to observe and describe what they see, uh, it also can uh, improve their communication skills throughout the science. Uh, basically, we want them to like, uh, okay, one of the experiments uh, we have done is a volcano experiment where we mix a vinegar and a baking soda. So they can see that there's an eruption uh, if we mix uh, vinegar and baking soda. So we want them to observe it. Oh, if we mix the vinegar and the baking soda, it will become like this. Uh, I am very, I am pretty sure they are very curious. So I will ask them to Google it at home. <laughs> so no la. So normally we as a teacher will explain it a little bit. So uh vinegar uh is an AC uh AC acidic and then the baking soda is a alkali. So if you like mix it together, it will like boom. So don't do that at your house, it will like mess your kitchen or itself so we want them to describe what they see they want uh, we want us to describe what they experiment it they uh, what they experience it by themselves so i think that's all for my answer do i answer your question doctor <laughs> i have an extra question um oh. okay um now what did you report to the parents um because if primary and secondary school then it's very clear there's a report card and then you need to meet the parents at uh, parent teacher day uh, so for your kindy uh, what kind of uh, communication that you have with the parents okay for the kindergarten we actually have the parents teacher meeting uh, at least two months uh, once so uh uh, every two months, we will call their parents and we will tell them about their improvements and then their what they need to improve, what they need to like uh, bring or something like that. So every two months, we actually will talk with their parents about themselves. Lah. So if the face to face uh, face to face meeting with the parents, we we will done it for 
at the end of the school session is actually around October or November. I didn't get experience that because I already come to UTM. So yeah. Uh, and then there are some parents that we, when they send their kids to the kindergarten, sometimes they will talk with the teachers. They will like, uh, teacher, how do I uh, let the kid like, 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 like that? So, okay, we as a teacher also give an advice or how to do, how to do like that. So, normally, in a daily life also, we get to uh, report to the parents itself. So, instead of like two months or like six months or whatever, we actually did talk to the parents every day uh, when they send their kids to the kindergarten every day. Do I answer it, Dr. Doria? Uh, yes. Uh, before I ask more questions, Legion, you have a question? Yes. Nice to meet you, Isa. Uh, I want to know, um, children uh, become six years old, they will go to primary school. And for little children, when they go into primary school, they will um, face new environment and a new challenge. They will feel anxious. anxious. Uh, so as a um, kindergarten teacher, how um, do we make children uh, ready go to primary school? So how we as a teacher make them ready to go primary school, is it? Yes. Okay, uh, as a, for teacher itself, I believe that uh, we as a teacher have need to have an effort to make them feel very safe, uh, whatever environment they are in. So, uh, like I said before, we before they go to primary school, they need to master a little, uh, master uh, all the skills before they go to primary school itself. Wait, I'm sorry. So, uh, me as a educator, maybe I will like, um, maybe help them, because uh, even though uh, when we teach a six years old, we really ask them to feel how to see. We will teach them how to feel safe in every environment, uh, how to not feel anxious with every environment. So we will say, okay, before they go to primary school, we did. Uh, we also like always talk okay when you go to primary school uh, you need to be independent with yourself you need to you need to like okay uh, be with your own self because the teacher will not be there for you all the time we will actually talk to them uh, slow uh, slowly it's not like we really like push them okay go to primary school you need to learn this you need to learn this you need to learn that actually no we as a teacher itself need to approach them uh, a little by little. So uh, we, I, so as far as I know, uh, all the kids at this kindergarten, when they go to primary school, uh, luckily they are not like feel really anxious when, when they are at the environment itself. Because this company also actually have uh, an international school. It's like a home school for the kids who want to like go to primary school uh, is, is in pri private primary school. So normally the kids will not go to the government primary school because government and private primary school is quite different. So to maintain their, uh, to maintain their attitude and something like that, to maintain their, uh, how to say? Mm. It's okay to maintain to maintain uh, them to not be anxious. We actually ask them to uh go to. It's not as uh, we'll ask them to go private school. It's actually the parents itself will send them to private school. So yeah, private school and government school, but government school is quite different. Do I answer your question or not? <laughs> Uh, let me rephrase Legion's question. I think uh, uh, what Legion is trying to ask is, okay, uh, yes, there's one component where uh, um, we have to send our children away for primary school, but then uh, probably in your experience, 
how do you come down the children? So, for example, children who come to your kindergarten for first day, uh, don't want to separate from mom, uh, having problem, uh, like starting to work in the kindergarten with others, uh, prefer to stay alone, prefer to cry. So, in this kind of situation, uh, the children are anxious. They they are not familiar with the situation. So, how do you and your colleagues help to calm them down? Something like that. Oh, it will be like if there's no children crying for the first day. At the first day, during the first day of school, I want to go back. I want to go with mommy. Oh, it's okay. I will say the first week of school is a disaster <laughs> for us as a teacher. So normally, how we help them to calm them is uh, let them be for a while. If they want to cry, okay, let them be for a while. Maybe they want to like um, let out their emotion by crying. We will not try to like stop them or anything. We will try to like calm him or her down. We will like, we will like, uh, we will talk to them. Okay, it's okay. Uh, later we'll you will go see mommy after this, and then, uh, we try to distract them, distract them with uh, a fun activities. So that is why, uh, learning through the old method is very, oh, you know, uh, it's how to attract kids nowadays is by fun activities. They don't like. Uh, just like I said before, they don't like sit in a trap classroom. They don't like write. They don't like, they don't like like see at the whiteboard and like sitting down, like learning, blah 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 blah, something like that. So we will attract them by like, okay, for the first day we go to playground to have fun. So they will know, uh, to remove their anxiousness. Uh, we they will know. Uh, when they come to school, uh, the teacher will. Uh, let them play in. Let them play while learning, instead of learning from the old. Uh, learning from morning to afternoon. So we will let them to remove the anxiousness. Ah, that's how me and my colleague do that. So yeah. Okay. Uh, Richard, hopefully they answer your question. Uh, because your question has two components. Uh. Component one is the anxious feeling. Component yeah. two is the primary school uh, element because uh, anxiousness can happen anywhere. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, do you have anything to add? Anything to... Sorry? Thank you, Isa. Yeah. My question oh. is how to comfort children when they anxious uh, meet, uh, face a new environment. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, you answered the question, uh, Isa. So, uh, th uh, thanks, Li Jian, for that. Uh, anyone else have extra questions to ask uh, Isa? Okay, Isa, while waiting for the rest to, uh, to uh, ask questions, um, now, can you share with the class? Um, okay, uh, there's this concept if you're studying uh, education behaviorism, essentially, um external stimulus will shape the student lah. so if the student behaves well you give incentive if the children doesn't behave well you give penalty or punishment uh do you guys do that or you you do a different method to to uh to manage the children's behavior we actually do a different method instead of give them penalty or will we get angry with them they will not come to school tomorrow they will say okay. to their mommy they will say that to their mommy oh the teacher is very furious i don't want to come to school because the teacher always get angry to me oh we cannot do that okay uh, i i i oh oh my god if we do that the kid will not come to school tomorrow <laughs> so how do you manage uh the their behavior because sometimes they do not know why they are behaving that way right mm, yeah so how we do it, okay, uh, let's say, uh, we will say to them, okay, the first one finished will get prison. And then the last one finished, uh, we'll receive a penalty. We only see like that. We will like, uh, 
ask them to do the work faster because we need to see their improvement and everything so on. But actually, we did give them the present, uh, the presents from the first one finish until the last one finish. Okay, so it's present. Uh, sorry, it's still uh, it's still behaviorism. Uh, it's still focusing, behaviorism. Focusing on getting them to uh show good behavior. Uh yes. But uh, yeah, if we get angry, they, they will not come to school. Okay. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> the things happen. The things oh happen. <laughs> okay, guys, any other question that you want to ask? Um, anyone? I have been the one asking a lot of questions in this class uh, this time around. So, guys? Okay, in that case, let me ask the final question before we close our uh, session. Um, will you uh, open your own uh, center, Early Childhood Education Center? Uh, why am I putting this question out? Is because uh, in Malaysia, at least uh, the market is booming. Uh, it's where we can make money. Uh, it's an so far unregulated field. Unregulated mean you still need a license to open up an early childhood center. Uh, but um, you don't. Uh, at current point of time, uh, the government doesn't require teachers to be certified, or they will not come down to do audits and checks. Uh, so um, will you open a center on yourself? Uh, I will say no because okay. <laughs> because <Why? laughs> because actually, uh, I I do like kids. I do like teaching the small kids. But to maintain that, you know, the feeling you need to like okay, you need to like okay, it's okay, it's okay. Oh, that thing like it really takes a lot of effort, and I don't think I can do that <laughs> for. If like teach them for like one to two years, I think okay. But if like more than two years, I don't think I can. But if for, uh, even the one to like open a kindergarten for uh, no 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 no. <laughs> okay, okay, then, no. then uh the question on your boss because your boss operates the center. Uh, is he uh passionate towards the field or he has he is trained in the field? Because you don't come into a early childhood market without having an interest, at least. Yeah. Before this, I talked to my boss before, and he said that he's very passionate with the kids. And I can see that he always come to the kindergarten and play with the kid, even though he's a boss. He like he likes to play. He likes to like do the activities with the kids, even though there's no lesson plan at all. He can think. Uh, and activities like just like click like that, he can like, oh, I can say like, oh, he's very, very, very good boss where he can show, uh, passionate teaching towards the kids, and it's actually not easy, even like for, uh, I I I actually uh I can say this like uh, okay, uh actually during uh working there for eight months, there's a lot of teacher who come and they like left, come mm -hmm. for one day and then left. They don't have the uh passion to teach. For teaching later kids, you need to have two patient. The first one you need to have patient in teaching. The second one you need to have a lot of patient when dealing with the little kids. Because their emotion is like, uh, we never know what will happen next. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay. So I would say like, I really, really uh, respect my boss because he really passionate. He can control the whole class with two and three years old alone. So mm. it's actually a hard thing to do to mm. <laughs> for us. Yeah. Okay, uh, I saw one question in the chat function, Isa, uh, from uh, Flora. Uh, yeah, Flora, are you here? Uh, yes, Doctor. I have a question about the um, children's attention. 
Uh, maybe some children in the early childhood in their like to talk talking and very active and in attention in the class. So uh, I don't know how to improve this student's attention. Yeah. Thank you, Isa. Yeah, welcome. So actually yeah. how, how to spell my name is Zach, not S. <laughs> so just correcting them. Uh, it's C, not S, right? Uh, yeah, it's okay. So uh there's actually some of the students that are not like really hyperactive, but some of them are hyperactive. So uh, there are two ways of how to improve their attention uh, in the class. Uh, so the first one, if the students, we can see that they are hyperactive, we will ask them to jump uh, at the trampoline for like 20 to 30 minutes to let their energy out. Because the hyperactive students and the normal students have the different level of energy. So, <laughs> so how to improve <laughs> their <laughs> so how to improve their attention is uh when the hyperactive students we ask them to jump or run whatever you want to do for 20 minutes. Oh. Just do whatever you want. Let out your, your energy. If for normal students, normally they can give their attention, full attention during the class. But as I said before, how to let them have a full attention is not sit at the class all the time. Uh, bring out them, go to the field, go to the playground, go to see, okay, at the kindergarten, we have a smart board where they can touch the TV. Uh, so we will bring them to go there as well to improve their attention uh, during the class uh, during the class so for hyperactive students just now we ask them to run run or jumping or whatever you want for 20 minutes then when he's already tired he can give uh, attention during the class so from experience actually uh, I take him, I take care of one of hyperactive students in the class so if you didn't let uh, the hyperactive students to bring out their energy they will disturb the other kids in the class so basically all the kids inside the class all already lost attention because that's because of that one particular kid so how to do is yeah just like bring them go out instead of sit in the class that's all do i answer your question yeah, yeah. Um, let them to run or to jump to release their energy. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, Isa, I'm closing the session soon, but then uh, just one more question from me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> because you mentioned hyperactive, uh, hyperactivity, uh, meaning uh. It may be a, a, a condition, a learning condition. Uh, I'm not familiar with this area. Uh, so uh, does your kindergarten do diagnost diagnost diagnostic uh, assessment? Meaning, okay, you notice these children is learning in a different way, or you notice uh, this child has difficulties writing uh, words or numbers um in 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 the correct way so when uh do when you you guys had noticed this kind of uh patterns do you do tests to determine what kind of learning abilities or the disabilities that they have or you you only report to you to the parents okay when we see the uh, quite different kids from the other normal kids we will uh first we will report to the parents first so uh actually the speech delay the writing delay the hyperactive is actually normal for kids uh we cannot see them as a uh, different from the others but maybe the method of our teaching must different from the others so first we will report to them and the parents itself must bring them go to see a uh, child expert and then they will uh, send the report to our kindergarten so we ourselves as a teacher we can uh, do a different uh, activity 
uh, instead of the normal one. So for, like I said before, for hyperactive students, we will ask them to go around jumping around whatsoever. For speech delay kids, uh, we will ask them to uh, slowly speak instead of we ask them to like go boom, speak. No, we will like, okay, slowly speak. Okay, what is this? Apple, something like that. So uh, at uh, our kindergarten only train them. We don't diagnose them with uh, the, the, the thing, lah, the hyperactive thing and the speech delay thing. We only like report and then we get the report from the uh, hospital. Then we will uh, do a different activity for them and different uh, way of teaching to them. Okay. Uh, I was I was about to close the session. There's uh two more questions okay. coming in. I think yeah, guys. Uh, do you mind if you uh, if you answer these questions? Uh, if I can answer, then I will answer. Okay, go I, I try to uh, answer. Yu Chie, uh, are you here? Sang Yu Chie, okay. yeah. Thank can you. you ask the question directly? Yu Chie. Uh, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. What? I will I will read it. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, it's okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. If, if the children's language development is uh, relatively slow, uh, therefore, he he does not like to talk. Uh, nor does he like uh like to play with the children. Uh, how can we guide him in the in this situation? Uh, for example, how to help him development and develop language skills, uh, how to help him improve his skill, uh, social skills. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you for the question. It's actually a good question. Uh, so normally the kids who don't really like to talk or don't really like to play is because uh, they always speak in their mother tongue language. They don't really have exposure to English language. So, uh, how do we guide them in this situation? So, first, we will approach them in their mother tongue language. So, as for Chinese, we will speak Mandarin to them. Uh, we will ask them, like, why? What happened? So, we need to have this slow pace with the children instead of the fast pace. The children need a lot of attention and they... They need to like have a slow pace instead of the fast pace so they can learn, they can like adapt with the situation, they can adapt with the uh, environment really well. So how to help them is actually to approach them in their mother tongue language instead of approach them with the second language. So approach them with the first language first, the mother tongue language. And then we will ask them, okay, what is this? Okay, let's play with friends. Okay, uh, come, let's play. We we will try, uh, we will try that. We will try to ask them to communicate with their friends, to have uh, to talk with their friends, even though in mother tongue language, we will not get angry with them. We will okay. We will say okay. Uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Tzu is makan, uh, it should, is eat, right? So, uh, we will ask that, uh, Niao Tzu ma, okay, do you want to eat? Okay, then uh, the slowly the kids will like adapt with the situation, then we will use the second language. So, therefore, it can improve the social, uh, social skills and develop their language skills. Do I answer your question? I, uh, yes, uh, yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I think this is the last question. <laughs> yeah, Chiu Chong, uh, uh, please ask your question. Uh... Uh, Chiu Chong. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh Pierre Jin has suggested that children's cognitive development is character characterized by self centeredness. Uh, what do you think of this? Uh, well, I was, I'm, I'm cu um, curious about the spe spe specific behaviors of the early children. Well, I don't really understand the question <laughs> very well. <laughs> okay, like... let me translate. Uh, let me <clears throat> translate the question. Um, 
okay, um, there's a theory uh, that says that uh, in order for children to grow, uh, you need to um, under get uh, you need to understand the children's perspective, meaning uh, you emphasize on the children's point of view. Uh, you emphasize on uh, they're doing a good job. For example, you know every time you, when children does a good a child a child does a good job, you need to praise the child. Uh, the world revolves around the child. Do you notice that in in your kindergarten? Mm, yes, I would see that because uh, children point of view and adult point of view is quite different. So as an early child educator, we need to see from their point of view to make them feel safe around us, to make them share everything with us. So I think that's how we uh, implement all the skills there, implement all the how we how we see them so they will come to school they want to learn with us uh, something like that okay so hopefully Chung -chung, that answers your question uh okay. the is tested. um probably you might want to go and study in a different context uh related to prj so guys i have to close the session uh isa is getting sniffy i think <laughs> yeah. he was a bit uncomfortable at the moment so um, please join me in thanking Isa virtually uh, in love from uh, uh, um, hand claps and so on. Uh, thank you so much for coming to, uh, to my class today. Uh, really enjoy the sharing of uh, knowledge. And uh, guys, um, for our session next week, uh, 5th of June is a public holiday, so we will not be having any class, uh, but our class will come back on the 12th of June, 12th of June. Uh, this time around, I'm bringing Debbie into my classroom. Debbie is from Hong Kong, uh, used to come to Malaysia for a three-month internship program under Isaac. Uh, she works in, uh, in the Johor Cheshire Home. Um, a, a home that is focused on uh, the disabled. So she will give a, another different perspective for everyone. Uh, and uh, once again, Isa, really thank you. Sorry for oh, your, your sick, but then you have to come to class for this session. And uh, thank you, guys. I'll see you in two weeks' time. All right, let me stop the recording.